Hello, this is Luis Ganides. I'm a mom, personal trainer, and group fitness instructor living in New York City. And today I'm with Stan Medvedev. Medvedev. Oh. <laughs> From where are you, Stan? Say it again. Tur Turkmenistan. Tur Tur Turkmenistan. No, that one's better. <laughs> that was better than the last thing. So I'm going to ask Stan to introduce himself, but. Uh, when I started my career in New York City working for Equinox, Stan was already there teaching classes and all the time we spoke he sounded he's a very smart, fun, cool, laid back guy. <laughs> and I'm very happy to be able to share this moment and so more people can listen to this guy. Anyway, Stan, introduce yourself. Uh, well, hi everybody, my name is Stan, thank you for having me. Uh, I've been a trainer um, at Equinox for about a little over five years now. Uh, certified strength and conditioning specialist, uh, precision nutrition certified, so can give you some advice on that, a little bit. <laughs> uh, big soccer fan, been in the US since 2002, originally from Turkmenistan. Uh, have a degree in advertising, not very relatable, but it's there. Yeah. No, it's good. I have a degree in journalism. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. Isn't that how most people end up in the fitness industry? They do something and they're like, eh, let me go train some people and then they realize it's a lot better. That's a good question. Like, uh, when I decided to pursue this career, I thought, you know, if I'm going to have to really work, I want to choose something I really like. Mm -hmm. Is that the thought that came up to your head? Yeah, I, like, after I, because I started in finance. My first, my education was in finance. And uh, along the line somewhere, I'm good with numbers. I love math. But somewhere along the way, I was like, I just don't want to do this. Ended up switching while in college, changing my majors. Once I graduated, just didn't want to work in an office. And uh, actually ended up getting a job at Equinox out of spite. If you want to hear that story. Um, a couple of my friends were already working at Equinox while I was still in college. And I had uh, submitted an application, uh, had an interview, didn't go so well. I was like, ah, whatever. Graduated from college, a friend of mine started a music company. Uh, music, like uh, jingles and related for commercials and other uh, licensable stuff. And uh, he said, you know, you know, if you want to come work for me. I was like, yeah, sure. That was kind of slow going, so I told him, look, I'm going to go apply to Equinox again. I have two options. I can apply for personal training, which is going to give me a lot of money, hopefully, but not a lot of time <laughs> uh -huh. for music, and or I can go and apply for, you know, phone desk, where I'll get less money, but have a lot more free time. He's like, they're not going to ever hire you as a personal trainer, so I was like, okay, watch this. So I ended up getting a job at Equinox <laughs> out of spite, uh -huh. so, but I've been there for over five years now. Five years now. Well, so I know, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but uh, how much people pay an hour to have a session with you? A uh, single session is 140 140 dollars so you know this is one or more of the reasons and people pay and I'm pretty sure they get uh, gladly because it's good to have someone to in start on the right path no, right? absolutely absolutely everybody could use some kind of feedback I mean including us trainers all the way exercise oh. I always recruit some of my colleagues to come back and check me out you know see if they have any kind of suggestions see if they kind of feedback you know I love one of my favorite things to do is actually go back and talk to my own colleagues and discuss the things how we can make each other's you know workouts better and how we can make each other you know make each other achieve better results and uh, so that's always it's always nice because some of my clients they just want to come in and they want to work out and they want to get out uh, they don't really care about why or how or you know they don't care about the background works why we're choosing certain activities why am I telling them to do certain things uh, when you're working with people who are like minded like-minded and who want to know things there's always a lot more kind of information exchange so there is a little bit more of a teaching learning thing going uh, and that's not about just the movements themselves but again the general logic behind everything we do no, I was thinking about this, like, I don't know how personal training is in other places in the world, right? But New York City, there's a lot of money going on the city. Yeah. And then, like, I was thinking about our careers, you know, like, with the possibility of training one person, uh, you know, one individual and learning from this person and applying methods that you have applied on yourself or you have been studying and trying different approaches, what it works, what it doesn't work. I feel that, you know, this gives us a very good... Um, um, background in fitness. Oh, absolutely. Think. No, absolutely. I think that, that, but that's, I think, one very important thing. Is anytime I suggest something to some people, I either have tried it, or I hopefully have read, or have talked to somebody, or have some kind of a, you know, a background on why I'm giving somebody a certain, you know, exercise to do or a certain whatever program to follow. Uh, it's important to make sure that there's some kind of a feedback. 
Yeah. They're awesome guinea pigs where you kind of look at things and like, okay, well, I have this idea. Let's see how it works. But ideally, it's always better to work off of something that's been tried and you know and tested and works as opposed to just something random. Yes, yes, yes. And then comes the big uh, background Equinox provides towards studying and courses oh, yes. and certifications. No, absolutely. That's one thing that's been very good. I. Uh, you can get any certification. You can go out and you can learn some things. Um, the internet is a huge resource now. You can find a whole bunch of certifying bodies, but you still don't learn uh, nearly as much as one you learn through your peers because there's always constant knowledge exchange whether it's mini sessions that you know your own colleagues will teach or even the, our own younger trainers that will come in and start asking questions hopefully it's something i can answer right away and if it's not something i can answer right away it becomes an even better question because i learned something from it something new from it myself uh, but on top of that obviously our management is always teaching us they are always recruiting new people to bring in and teach us new things so we're always expanding our toolkits and um, EFTI the Equinox Fitness Training Institute and the curriculum that we have to complete uh, for our promotions or uh, even the extracurricular extra certifications that they have available they're all ex uh, excellent just lots and lots of knowledge available and very very easily accessible and cheap you know, honestly, I think it was a great uh, start base for myself. Uh, I think it's amazing because they do have like this. Uh, I think they're on top of the fitness industry here in no, New York absolutely. City. They always are trying to teach whatever is the best that they are putting his hands on. No, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. So Equinox should pay me for this adver advertising. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think yeah, there's no. I really don't think there's another company in the fitness industry anything i mean first of all i don't know if there is another company as big as equinox in regards to just pure you know value but anything that with so much personnel and make sure that everybody's on the same page and make sure that everybody knows what they're doing there's constant research being done and everything that equinox educates is research driven and uh, whenever things need to be updated they're constantly updating it because fitness is a relatively new field and still expanding and there's still so much more there are so many more things that you can learn and as the new things become public some new knowledge becomes public equinox does it the best job you know trying to make sure that that's implemented into our curriculum and we're aware of it that's true that's true i gotta agree with it um so let's go to this podcast because yes. <laughs> i wanted to ask like when i asked it i uh, stand to do this with me i had other idea in my mind because he's really good in mobility like uh, fixing people you know he's really good maybe we'll talk about it a little bit but uh, he told me no that's boring <laughs> let's talk about getting ready for summer yeah, exactly and, and i think so true, right? i think yeah some people again going back to the things that i mentioned about how my clients you know teaching them certain things one thing i've learned People need to be more mobile, they don't necessarily care about being more mobile. People need to be able to do certain things, but they don't always know. Most people, what they know is they take off their shirt on the beach and then they go, uh. and that's one thing you want to make sure that you know, that's one thing they will be really upset about. I was like, oh, look at this, look at that, I got to lose this, I got to do that. Yeah. So yeah, I think, uh, you know, summer body is, a, especially now, it's a big topic. Especially with a day like today, it's a little windy, but it's very sunny. So people are hanging out outside, people take their jackets off. <laughs> Hopefully nobody's taking their shirt off yet, but yeah, you know, yeah. I'm well, sure they'll be coming. There's a Buzino walking around, this might, be, might happen. Yeah. Um, so I really want to ask you, Stan, with this basic question. What are your recommendations? Okay, well, one of the main important ones is... Uh, First of all, people need to each, for everybody, it's going to be different. One, you need to determine what is really that you want. So figure out your goal. Because a lot of times people will find some kind of a nice article somewhere, where it's, whether it's a magazine, uh, and on some kind of online publisher. It's like, oh, here's Instagram a... Instagram people. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah, like, here's a yeah. good workout. Here's a good exercise routine. Do that. Yeah, absolutely do. But do you know what it's for? Does it necessarily suit your goal? Some people come into me saying, "Hey, look, I'm you know I'm trying to get my arms, my shoulders a little bit bigger, you know, a little bit better looking, uh, you know." But overall, they look pretty thin, pretty healthy. Everything is no problem. They just need to put on a little mess. What they will need to do is going to be different. There are people who come into me and say, "Hey, my midsection is a little bloated. You know, I need to lose a few pounds." Their exercise routine is going to be different than the people who are just trying to put on mess. So first and foremost, everybody, well, each person, each individual needs to determine what their individual goal is. Um, for most of us, it will be as simple as looking in the mirror and saying, okay, I would like 
to for that to look better that to look better and maybe that to look better and then see what that better is maybe getting a little bit stronger or a little bit more you know muscular maybe getting a little bit thinner maybe getting a little leaner maybe don't necessarily want to change your overall shape overall size maybe just want to tighten up a little bit which normally means losing a little bit of body fat so that's always the first place to start and once you have that then we can talk about different strategies that you can use to you know that you can implement to actually achieve those results okay uh, what do you think is the most common uh, requirement between the, everybody you talk about okay. I think normally what happens is during the winter uh, months everybody gets a little lazy there's no Sun everybody puts a couple of layers of clothing and then they stay in and then they eat a little bit more than they should so one of the more common ones is like oh yeah I gotta lose a few pounds yeah. or I gotta look a little bit thinner or yeah my bikini doesn't fit as well as it did last year what happened chances are what happened was we just took in a few more calories than we should have and didn't burn as many calories as we should have so that's normally one of the most common things is just getting either a little bit tighter or losing a few pounds you know everybody looks at it a little bit differently but at the end of it it's either normally it boils down to just uh, body fat reduction body fat reduction all right so let's go to body fat reduction in a little bit we talk a little bit of uh, muscle masking mm -hmm. so body fat reduction what would you advise exercise wise or we can bring movement wise mm -hmm. whatever how you would you yeah. really like to call it yeah um, the one thing about normally uh, body fat fat essentially is just a way of your body storing fuel so normally it boils down to simple calories in versus calories out so um, second law of thermodynamics I know many people know but it's essentially in a system as it puts some energy through it if the total net flow of uh, energy is positive so as in if the calories that the system is taken in is more than the calories it's putting out the system's mass will grow and uh, you know mathematics right <laughs> physics <laughs> math terrible. Yes. yeah it's so, like, okay but anyway I think yeah, I got it. Okay. yeah so it's essentially when you take in more calories than you're burning you end up gaining mass and yes. normally that mass is fat yes. now your activity levels will determine what kind of mass you get so somebody who's very very active and somebody who eats a lot a lot of healthy food but their activity level makes up for the amount of food that they who normally end up getting good muscle mass unfortunately most of us during winter time we're just sitting on our asses watching Netflix and eating, I don't know, something that maybe shouldn't be eating. Uh, so what ends up happening is we just end up storing a little bit more energy. Yes. So based on that, what we need most of, my, my general suggestion is obviously you have to watch you, what you eat. And that's not necessarily just for the weight loss. Obviously it will have a big impact there, but what you eat will directly impact your health. They're like the things that you put in and it's not you should be eating you should be watching what you eat in general it's like you know you don't just go out randomly eat things you don't think about people tell you not to eat vegetables people tell you to get all your you know vitamins and nutrients in because it's good for your health you know liver function kidney function heart function brain function all of that that's not even a fitness thing that's just a general health thing now uh, as you watch what you eat the other thing is also obviously making sure that you're active enough to create some kind of a caloric deficit. Um, I remember when I just first learned about it, my manager, Anthony, at that point, I don't know if you ever met him. No, no. He, no. Taught, he taught us a very simple model of uh, a single pound of fat is equal to 3,500 calories. That's just when you, it takes 3,500 calories to, to uh, melt away a pound of fat. 3,500 Cal 3, 3, calories. Oh, yeah, 3,500 calories. To yeah. burn one pound of fat. To burn one pound of fat. So, now, the easiest way to look at it is you essentially need to create a 3500 calorie calorie deficit over a period of time that's going to get rid of uh, you know a pound of fat that math is not precise because as you eat more your metabolism speeds up as you move more your metabolism speeds up but the thing is you need to eat a little bit less or your metabolism slows down so maybe you'll you know anyway there are little discrepancies but for the purposes of simple math 3500 calories now, if you divide those 3,500 calories into a week, you have seven days, so you can approach a pound of fat loss in as simple as a 500 calorie deficit per day. Okay. So, a good way to look at it is imagine you've been the same weight for like the last two, three months. You've been kind of, you kind of gained a few pounds, but you've stayed on. So, whatever you're doing now and whatever you're eating now keeps you at a very even keel which is nice now if you add a 250 calorie workout to that extra every day and then you end up eating 250 calories less every okay. day that adds up to a total of 500 calorie loss that's good yeah so that's, you, that's a good cook yeah, so, yes, exactly, exactly. so you uh, 
as you maintain that for a prolonged period of time, you just slowly, the weight will go away. That's How many calories do you think you can induce a client to spend in one hour? That's a good question. That, that becomes there. That's where the importance of uh, uh, exercise or movement you know, type uh, comes into play. So, depending on what kind of things you need to do, normally there are two strategies that I personally employ. And I, I think that's a relatively straightforward concept and a lot of other trainers use the same. One thing you can do is you can increase your basal metabolic rate, and that's essentially how many calories you burn at rest, at a complete rest. Uh, to do that, you will go on, do some strength training, and put on some lean mass, because lean mass is very important. Your skeletal muscle mass, we're not talking about getting you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger big. We're just talking about putting on a couple of good pounds of mass, so that helps you burn more calories. Because honestly, almost all my clients have desk jobs, they're not yes. in a position to be able to go out and do some kind of hard work. If you're a farmer, that's great because your work is labor. So you'll be burning calories left and right. Most of my clients have to go and sit behind computer uh, and either work with spreadsheets or send them emails back and forth and occasionally they will go walk over uh, to a colleague's desk and then come back. So not much activity going on. So that's where it becomes important that you put on a little bit of lean mass, muscle mass uh, through strength training and that will help you burn some more calories while you're you know while you're not actually exercising uh the other part to strength training normally is uh, the excessive post-exercise oxygen consumption so when excessive, what's it excessive post-exercise oxygen consumption so okay. the acronym is epoc epo mm -hmm. epoc mm -hmm. so epoc is um, much more elevated for strength training than it is for aerobic training. We're going to mm -hmm. come back to aerobic training in a sec because it's still very important. Mm -hmm. But what essentially it does is as the muscles recover post intense activity, uh, as the tissue recovers, it uses more oxygen. And the importance of that is that to metabolize fat, you need oxygen because fat is oxidized. Okay. So as fat gets oxidized, your body produces ATP molecules. Um, which is your energy and then it also produces water and carbon dioxide molecules so in case anybody ever asks you what happens to fat how does it leave your body it's in form of energy and then form of water and then form of uh, carbon dioxide so you exhale it and then maybe you cry it or maybe you sweat it <laughs> hopefully you don't cry it but you know some people take it during the seriously. session after the session yeah, I before not, the session yeah, i normally i look at my clients like look you're not crying we're not working hard enough <laughs> Uh, These days ago a client told me like, uh, oh my god, I almost cried after this <laughs> because she's so like new to exercise mm -hmm. and she tries so hard, you know, I was so proud yeah. of her when no, she said no, it. That, that's very yeah. good. It's just, you know, I like to keep my <laughs> clients, if they're crying because they're very happy with exercising, very good, but just want to have very positive associations, especially with people who are newer to and then I assume it's like really, really hard work. Yes, hard work pays off and it's important, yes, but it doesn't yes. have to be like, you know, always, always hard. And we can, you know, those are, especially for clients who are in a very high stress situations most of the time, you want to make sure that the stress that they undergo through the workout is, you know, uh, is a positive stress, not something that just adds more negativity to their life. Yes. So, yeah. But that's, you know, that's... That's very important, and I'm sorry to cut you off, no just course. because... Um, because uh, when you're exercising, you're actually stressing your body. Oh yes, absolutely. Right? absolutely. And I, 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 I'm realizing through the experience that I've been going through is like uh, some people are in a highly stressed job, mm -hmm. highly stressed in their minds. They are not eating well, and they are not eating well, and then they come to exercise, and then it's more stress because mm -hmm. they're seeing it like a stress load. So it's just like a hateful zone. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot of. It's a lot of negative 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 um, i don't want to put like activity but there's almost there's you want to keep it positive one you want to make sure your clients enjoy it some people just will never enjoy exercise so i kind of made peace with that so they're there <laughs> but they're, it's not also not the same way they're like they're they're kind of looking forward to it but they're not necessarily like oh yes this is very exciting some people are like that and if you're one of those people then you can accomplish that much more uh, yeah, but, that's true. but uh, the, uh, one thing about it is again it, but it's i find that if you're working out on your own obviously it's one of those things you want to always do things that you're more excited to do because you're much more likely to actually do them if you have to go out and go and think of like oh my god i gotta do this workout again you're gonna run around and look for an excuse to not do it so yeah. if you're out there looking for a kind of routine to follow always make sure you're doing something that you enjoy because that will be you will be that much more likely to actually achieve your results
But that being said, if we go back to our original discussion of workouts, so strength training and the excessive post-exercise oxygen consumption, you know, as you uh, rev up your metabolism post-workout, you burn more fat. Uh, some studies show that you can burn up to like 300 extra calories on the day after a workout just because your body is recovering from that strength session. Okay. Now, the Good. important part to that sentence so is recovering because you can have the best exercise, the best routine, the best workout you've ever had, but changes don't really happen. The workout itself is just a gateway to changes. The changes happen while you're resting. So mm. that's where you, the second part comes into play, when, uh, and that's uh, rest and regeneration. Uh, and the two things there are sleep and nutrition. So, so you want to, because normally after you finish some kind of a strength training routine, you create some kind of a, it's very easily uh, possible you can create some kind of inflammation within your body. Uh, mm -hmm. There's always some micro trauma your body recovers through. And it's very important that you pick foods uh, that are not going to, you know, increase that amount, that inflammation, that irritation. So mm -hmm. that's where, you know, making sure that your uh, fluid intakes are up to par, making sure that you're getting, you know, your uh, fish oil and, you know, omega-3 fatty acids and all the other. So it's important to make sure that your nutrition is well balanced and it's helping you regenerate. Uh, everybody talks about, you know, protein and all the carbohydrates and all the big, you know, macronutrient breakdowns and those are important but you know your vitamins and the other nutrients the smaller ones and the phytochemicals that you get out of your uh, you know fruits and vegetables those are just as important and a lot of times people seem to kind of overlook them but you know making sure that you eat a very well balanced diet all the colors of the rainbow that's the easiest way to go uh, you know that will help you with your regeneration process and obviously sleep uh, maybe last but definitely not the least because uh, that's when most of our repair goes through so you know your body repairs itself while you're sleeping uh, no one I've noticed that plenty of times on my own when you get a great workout and you don't get quite enough sleep and you feel like crap the next day yes. as opposed to getting a good workout and getting you know proper eight to nine hours of sleep and feeling that much better the next day a little sore but ready to go again so uh, sleep a very very common thing that people really underestimate uh, yeah. really really underestimate I them. have a uh, it's, it's good you're seeing it because uh, some people start getting we're gonna talk about it now like uh, some people start getting on the right track towards exercising then okay not very careful about eating or whatever it's going on and they start feeling good with themselves and then suddenly they want to party a little bit more or overeat a little bit more oh, yeah. I deserve whatever it is and they tend to get off the loop yeah. that they started oh that's right? very that's actually a very good point to bring up and I talk to all my clients especially again going back to since we we're discussing you know like you know fat loss strategies uh, fat loss is a longer process it's very easy to eat you know three cheeseburgers and take in you know 6,000 calories in one day it is nearly impossible to burn 6,000 calories in one day unless you go out and you know like participate in an Ironman or something <laughs> so uh, the the problem with that is also a lot of times people go oh man I screwed up whatever and uh, you know I don't really care anymore because well I have all the work I've put in kind of got wrong. no it's not because it, it's all about consistency I tell my clients look if you're 75 percent of the time there you're gonna achieve some good results if you're 90 percent of the time there you're definitely gonna achieve some good results um, so it's it's not necessarily one day off and then everything forgotten the all in or all out is like the worst attitude you have it's about consistency any successful person at anything will tell you that they failed probably more times than they succeeded but once you succeed that's it once you get to your goal normally if you have a fitness goal once you get there maintaining it is much much easier than trying to get there for the first night so that's why if you have a bad night maybe you went out with your friends and you had a couple of drinks more than you should have had or maybe you just completely went overboard and really outdid yourself it's all right. I mean, yes, ideally it would have been nice if you avoided it, but that's okay. Let bygones be bygones. You have a whole week, two weeks, three weeks. I don't know. If your goal is for something that's six months away, if worst case scenario, it's a lifetime thing, you have all this time in the world to make up for it. The problem there is just you have to make sure that you restart now, not in a week when you've done more damage. Because the more, the worse you go, you know, the more makeup you have to do. So, so it's okay to occasionally fall off. But the importance there is to get back on it and the sooner the better and just you know being able to deal with failure like mentally it's a, it's a very very important thing and the people who are good at it 
people who say, okay, well, I screwed up now, but fuck it, now, you know, I'll, I'll do better next time. Those are the people that are normally much more successful in the long run. It's good you're saying this because uh, first, some people are getting into a very uh, unknown path, right? Mm -hmm. They don't really know what they're doing. Most of people, that's Absolutely. when they hire personal trainers, Absolutely. good ones to help them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and then they get on this unknown path and some people tend to cross from zero to a hundred right away. Yes. Like, uh, don't respect the body's limits, want to go and train really hard yes. and eat very little and mm -hmm. rest very little, you know, don't change habits and just keep on adding on the plate right and then they tend to like oh i can do this this is so yeah. hateful i no. can do this or get hurt or something like no, that absolutely and then they give up yes. instead of just trying to understand and learn from the mistakes and pursue right yeah no that that's a very very good point you make because uh one thing i remember reading and i'm pretty sure it's through the precision nutrition people uh the quote was if it feels like a herculean effort if it feels like you have to uh, work really really hard to do what you're doing chances are you are not going to be able to sustain it if you can't sustain it it's never going to work so it's very yes. important to start off with baby steps and think about it as a, a long-term goal and it's always better to start you know when you have plenty of time ahead as opposed to you know some people have had that before like okay i have to go somewhere in two weeks i need to lose six pounds i'm like oh. <laughs> yeah you can realistically you can yeah, 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 I can yeah. easily cut your arm off. That's, that's probably more than six pounds. <laughs> but uh, let me talk about uh, energy burn. Yeah, it's possible to learn. It's absolutely possible to lose six pounds in two weeks. But the time that you have, the time frame is so short. And normally you don't really form any long lasting habits. So the six pounds will go and they're going to come back and probably are not going to come back double. And you will end up having 12 pounds to lose later. So it's very important to set up some kind of timely goals and start off a little bit easier. Because also another thing, also people come in, especially workout specific, especially guys will come in like, oh, I'm gonna work out everything. And then come in and doing chest and doing shoulders and doing arms and they're lifting all the weights. And then three days later, they can't move because everything is sore and then go, I don't wanna go to a gym anymore. And yeah, it's okay, don't happens. go to a gym for a couple of days. But the thing is there is if you come in and start a little lighter, you let yourself recover, you could have been going to the gym still. And one thing is, if you're sore for a couple of days, there's nothing wrong with that. But you have to be in your mind. You have to just remember that as soon as you're good to go, you have to be back in there doing some new things. Yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. It's good. Uh, Stan is talking about this because there is so many things that get in the middle of the way and tends to throw back people. And the cue, I think, I believe that is turning, as you said, in a lifestyle. You know, something mm -hmm. that you are gonna persist with Absolutely. and you're not gonna give up. I was talking to this client, saying, told him like, oh, he's like, oh, I still have this bag. I said, for how long you have been doing the wrong stuff? It's like, oh. 20, 30 years. Exactly. How yeah. long have you been consistent with exercise? You know, you have to no, you have to put something there. You have to put an extra effort, right? No, absolutely. Consistent in the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to you have to make sure that you're staying consistent. Because again, long term, you changes will happen. As long as your workouts are intense enough, as long as you're doing the right things, they will happen. Depending on how how accurate everything else, depending on how efficient your you know your workouts and how uh, you know, strict but honest you are with yourself, uh, changes will happen sooner or later, but they will happen. They Hopefully will if everything is, uh, everything is in place correctly, they will definitely happen. It's just again, uh, depending on what kind of scale. Some people will come in and some people are very good at making immediate changes. Like yes. people will go and uh, quit drinking cold turkey, especially for guys I find, if you need to lose a little bit of midsection, Go go out and over the course of a week, uh, one of my newer clients we talked about. I'm like, so what's your current drink? And he kind of laughed at us. I bet it goes. If I'm honest with myself, it's like probably about 12 to 15 drinks. And I was like, okay, depending on what kind of things you're drinking, even if you average it out to about you know 100 calories. And he kind of looked at it as like probably a little bit more depending on what kind of things you're taking. But even if you have 15 drinks at, at 100 calories, you're almost looking at. Uh, half a pound of fat in just drinks alone that's not the one counting food so for him I told him look if you stop drinking altogether and but you eat the same things and you exercise the same you've been exercising chances are you're gonna lose half a pound every week and this is by quitting drinking and that's with him not really exercising anything else if you add all that stuff into play number just grows so again it's just a matter of figuring out and that and I guess we're talking about the dietary part now Figuring out what's your what's your biggest kind of caloric uh, contributor. Um, a lot of people have heard of very you know various or 
very good successes of uh, low carb diet mm -hmm. and uh, the reason it works the same reason any other diet works is by caloric restriction most of us especially living in new york uh, you know live on a western diet and most of our western diet is very very carbohydrate heavy whether it's you know breads pasta or anything else involved in there there's quite a Eagles, few carbs pretzels, yes sweets. exactly exactly sweets a lot of pastries my favorite uh, but the thing there is if you look at let's say an average and i'm sure everybody's you know read a nutritional label at one point and says you know all the caloric suggestions are based uh on the 2000 calorie diet for most of us out of those 2000 calories uh, carbs will probably contribute like 70 maybe even 75 percent hopefully a little bit less so when you cut out even 60 percent of that if you cut out you all the carbs or a lot of the carbs you're losing like 60 you know percent of your calories so now instead of eating 2,000, you're literally stuck with what, like 800? Uh, and then obviously you're gonna replace some of them with something else. So there's a significant caloric reduction that happens and people aren't thinking about that. People are really thinking, I'm just cutting out carbs. So for everybody, it's gonna be different. Some people, you know, over drink. Some people are a little bit happy with their carbs. Uh, snacking, uh, frequent, whatever you eat the most frequently is normally what will contribute the most calories. Uh, this is not as common, but some people will actually overdo on healthier, higher, you know, higher calorie snacks. Like some people love avocados. Avocados are great. I will always encourage people eating avocados. Avocado. But you gotta remember that they have some good natural, healthy fats. But fats are heavier in calories. A single avocado can be a big, you know, contributor to your calories. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Anthony Joshua, the guy that just won the big fight against Klitschko, part of his diet he had to eat four or five thousand calories a day. And to help him that he would eat like two avocados, three pieces of toast, and like oatmeal for breakfast. So, you know, they're just kind of show not to discourage avocado consumption. I love avocados, they're great. Oh, I love avocados. Yeah, but so also nuts. Nuts are very good, but they're a little bit heavier in fat. So, you but know, if people were eating that thing, those things, they're mm -hmm. not eating those things. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, you're not yeah that's, that's the thing. That's, 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 yeah. yeah, most people, are, when they're gonna snack, they're gonna uh, sit up late at night and eat ice cream in chocolates that's normally a stress related thing and um, there goes another thing of well, you know another important thing because obviously we're talking about the uh, whole concept of nutrition and importance of nutrition there it's it nutrition is such a vast topic that like trying to cover all of it will be very tricky but you no know, general suggestions again obviously when you eat more vegetables when you drink enough water normally you're automatically because vegetables are nutritionally dense foods and that normally tends to satisfy your hunger much better mm -hmm. so eating enough new vegetables not to, not to sound like somebody's mom or like my mom because you always tell me <laughs> tell, tell me to eat vegetables but it's very important it's again important for your health but it's also important for you know if your goal is fat loss because you're going to be more satisfied and you're going to be less hungry so less likely to eat crap but the other reason why we eat crap again is not just because we like it but because a lot of times we are so stressed that yes. by the end of the day that you know again something a little sweeter just helps our brain feel a little bit better you know what they said they, who was the one study compared eating a box of chocolates to like being in love <laughs> so um, yeah, it's like a reward system. Yeah, exactly. like, oh my god, I worked so hard, you know, especially if you did an exercise. Exactly. I need a treat, you know, I need something sweet, whatever. Yeah, you know, so like and then go after the bad chores. Yeah, well that's that's the other thing is uh, was one of my clients who referred to it as moral licensing. He says, uh, I worked really hard today. I'm allowed to eat a bagel with cream cheese. No, you worked really hard today, you're allowed and you deserve to eat a very healthy meal to help yourself recover and keep working towards your goal. Not the other way around, you know, two steps forward, one step back. Yeah. It doesn't really work that yeah. way. But I, I, I wanna I wanna just to bring something towards carbohydrates and that's what I tell my clients too. It's like a I am someone that I have a serious problem with it. Like, uh, my husband can get a little ice cream pot, mm -hmm. had three spoons and stuff and put it mm -hmm. away. I can't, I can't. If I have one spoon, I'm gonna keep eating and probably eating more and more and more because it triggers that hunger hormone on me like crazy. The so this is what I say, like you gotta pay a little bit of attention on your choices and see how you behave with that. Absolutely. Right? There's some emotions connected oh, yes. with it, some like uh, anxiety, like I don't know. Yes, there's actually, 
yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely, because yeah, it's actually your the food, especially uh, the stuff that we snack on late night, is very much related to our neurotransmitters. You know, like dopamine, serotonin, and the levels of those in your brain, and that's why people have a certain amount of addiction to certain foods, just because it literally makes them feel better in the brain. And there's no tricky, like, there's no easy, sorry, way of getting out of it. It takes a bit of you know willpower, but it also takes a little bit of also kind of concentration. And normally, uh, a reduced stress levels will help reduce bad food intake. Because again, if you're coming in at the end of the day and you're beat down and you just want to feel better a little bit about things, you end up eating that pint of ice cream, that chocolate, and just again. Or but, go to the bar and drink. That's another part again. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Because yeah, there will there will be certain things that will happen in your brain as a result of consumption of those things that, that will make you feel better. Uh, so, and to help with the whole stress relief, I tell all my clients meditate, and the meditation doesn't have to be you know um, for you know for an hour. Yes, absolutely. Some people love it, and yes, absolute language. But it's, it's essentially anything that empties your brain and helps you focus on literally nothing or nothing stressful. Uh, one of my exercise. ways. Exercise. Absolutely, exercise. One of my favorite things is listening to music and walking around. Because like I walk somewhere, and, and especially with the nice weather, most of us will spend more time outside listening to music and just getting lost in the song. Uh, you can listen to some Whiskey Junkies. Yeah, so this <laughs> that's is my the band. band. Yeah, it's that's on my uh, band, by the way. Uh, Ah, on Spotify. Spotify. Yes. Uh, you play the guitar. I play guitar. I'm one of the guitars. We have two. Yes. I'm not as good as our lead guitarist, Johnny. But I'll play some live shows. I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, please let me know. Yeah. Let people know. Uh, I really love it. I heard it once. Like I heard, I started listening to it and remind me when I used to fight uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu competitions. Because just got me in the mood. Like I'm gonna break everything. <laughs> it's very good. Yeah, rock. We, yeah, we play good rock. We're not metalheads. Yeah. I'm a metalhead. Not so much rest to my band, but we play. We got. I'm very proud of the things we're writing right now. So, yeah, good. so very good. Okay. Understanding English is not my good part yet. I like a lot of the music. I like, yeah. I like the rhythm. And I'll tell you what, I frankly, I mean, I've been with the band for what, a year now? I still don't know any of the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's not my thing. Hard, I, hard. Yeah, yeah, but then again, that's my personal thing in music. I never really pay attention to lyrics. So it's good we're bringing this to the aspect because um, exercise itself, it's a great stress relief, yes. right? Especially yeah. if you find something you like or you mm -hmm. find a good trainer that is going to motivate you and mm -hmm. it's going to bring a different workout, something you like, whatever. I used to have a trainer that I used to call was tortured the whole session i ended up not working out with him anymore even though he was really good because he was you know you want to you know you want to relieve a little bit you want to yeah. feel happy about yeah, it yeah, right? absolutely, not absolutely. Only, uh finding something you like right as a as an, uh, a physical activity but meditation as you spoke yeah. something that is going to calm down your exactly brain, yeah, yeah, right? yeah and uh, yeah absolutely i mean some people like reading although i don't know i'm, I'm personally not a, not the biggest like you know uh uh how should I put this? Uh, a nighttime reader. Some people like to open up a book and just kind of get lost in it. I mean, most of my reading is frankly either current news or scientific. <laughs> uh, but again, could be a very good option. If it makes you feel better afterwards, if you're reading something depressed and you go to bed feeling worse, obviously don't do it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, definitely. It's TV sometimes gets you depressed. Absolutely. Don't do it. Don't yeah, do it. Turn off the, the news. And that's another well, reason I find uh, people end up staying, like people lose... Uh, sleep because they stay up watching TV late but in a way that's a way of escaping and you kind of just zone out while looking at the screen so in a way it could be a way of meditation but again one thing that's very important is that you need to sleep sleep will always be a good thing so if you're losing sleep because you're trying to meditate which I were meditating or trying to exercise there's probably there's probably a better way yeah because one thing is very important about sleep is your um, satiation and uh, you know hunger hormones uh, they get messed up with low sleep I don't know if you've ever noticed but if yeah. my days get really hectic and I'm running on like very very little sleep I will be hungry for no reason not yeah. necessarily because I haven't eaten but just that's what happens uh, that's true. I totally agree yeah, with Like it. ghrelin and leptin hormones there, they get messed up with, with a bad sleep cycle or a very shortened sleep cycle. So it's important that you sleep. Another thing about sleep is obviously you're recovering from all the exercise that you do. But the thing about sleep also, one, you don't eat when you sleep, I hope. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure some people have, you know, <laughs> sleepwalk into a fridge and cup yeah. and scoops of ice cream going back to bed. If you're not one of those very few, chances are you can go and... Uh, 
no, you go to bed and you sleep, so you don't eat, and you're burning fat calories. Yes, that's the only really kind of calories you're burning in your sleep, so it's very important. Yeah. So you can sleep eight, nine hours. That's how many more hours without you putting extra food in your mouth, and how many more calories, you know, calories that you, you know burn off through fat. Uh, and what? talking about uh, fat burn calories, um, I guess we should uh, very important thing we should cover is um, aerobic exercise. Because, you know, strength training, as I mentioned, will help you put on some lean mass and will help you increase, you know, uh, the EPOC amounts immediately post-exercise. But one thing to make sure that your body burns fat at optimal rates is actually training your uh, aerobic systems. Mm. And that is going out and doing some kind of cardiovascular activity that keeps you around, what, 60% of your heart rate reserve. And what that does, essentially, you will be burning calories where most of those calories comes in from the fat stored around your body. Okay. So yeah, uh, anytime people sometimes think, oh man, I had a really, really hard workout. Uh, you know, this is, I've burned so many calories. It's great, absolutely. I will never discourage a hard workout. But it's important to understand the importance of higher intensity workouts versus lower intensity workouts. Higher intensity workouts will always challenge you, will always give you some very, very good results, especially shorter term results. Uh, but you normally also with higher intensity training, you reach your plateaus much quicker and they tend to be much lower than the plateaus you reach over a lower, you know, longer, slower, steadier increase. Uh, so not to even talk about the plateaus, the general benefit is it's like if you learn to play guitar. Learning to play guitar is a skill. It's like fighting, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You, you learn how to do it over time. The same thing with strength, your body be learns how to be stronger over time. And the other thing is anything you teach it, like burning fat, it gets better over time with practice. Yes. So you spend more time doing aerobic activity to teach your body how to be more and more efficient at burning fat. Okay. So so you go out, yeah, so you go out, you, you can run outside, you can do elliptical, there's no significant, you know, difference, at least in the beginning. I'll always, if people, some people prefer biking, absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's just normally, you know, the types of muscles that are affected are a little bit different. Most of us will come in and they'll complain and like, you know, I have, you know, I need to get a little bit more abs. If that's the case, then you probably want to be uh, run a little bit more because there's slightly more core and upper body activation while in running as opposed to biking. Mm -hmm. So there are some, you know, there is some difference between different types of activities you can do. But at the end of it, especially with all my newer clients who are just starting and they haven't really been doing much cardio, I'll always suggest that they do a long, uh, slow duration type exercises where you essentially you get with your exercise and you do it for at least half an hour at whatever, 60, maybe 65, maybe even less, like 55% of your heart rate reserve. So if you're um, to give a number, so somebody who's like in their 30s, with a 60, you know, uh, uh, beats per minute resting heart rate, you're probably looking at about, you know, 130, 135, maybe 140 beats per minute at most. I like the comparison, like if you feel 0 to 10 being 10, the highest intensity, you're going to a 6, Yes, right? yes, absolutely, yes, yes, yes. Okay. yes. You okay. want to be able to talk during that exercise, because again, as I mentioned earlier, to burn fat, you need to oxidize, so you need oxygen. So there has to be a good amount of oxygen going in and a good amount of carbon dioxide going out. So you need to be able to breathe. So one of another good ways to do it is if you can comfortably speak a five word sentence without having to take a breath midway, it's good rate. Right? Mm -hmm. Again. So your recommendation is mixing up both styles? Well, in the beginning, I would suggest you will want to, again, if you're newer to cardiovascular exercise, start with long, slow duration. Just mm -hmm. do something, you know, teach your body how to burn fat. Because if that's the goal, if your goal is to burn fat, then you want to teach your body how to burn fat by doing those long, slow duration type exercises. Um, and I would suggest, you know, if you haven't done anything and you're just brand new to running, you want to make sure you'll get the proper form, blah, 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 everything, all that stuff. If you're not getting hurt, hopefully running, you will want to start with like 20, 30 minutes. If you've been doing it for a while, you can up, increase up to 45. Um, ideally, endurance exercise, you can go all the way up to 90 minutes. And again, if you're maintaining it, you know, at a good slow pace, all the calories that you burn within that time, or a good, good chunk of those calories that you burn, are going to come from the fat storage. Because there's always some glycogen that's available within your, you know, within your liver, within your muscle tissue. And the faster the heart rate, the higher intensity the exercises, the uh, source of energy changes. Just because the energetic demands become much faster, your body doesn't have time to, to metabolize fat to extract all the energy. 
fat is very abundant abundant in ATP molecules, and ATP molecules are our energy molecules. But the enzymatic process, like the actual chain reactions, it takes I think about 10, 10 reactions as opposed to two or three for the shorter cycle. You know, uh, faster energy sources. So because of the fact that the energy takes so much longer to be extracted, you want to make sure that you are not demanding too much energy from your body. So that's why you do slower, steadier exercise. To set you up for the next. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. And once you have a pretty good aerobic base, once you've been doing that for two, three weeks, because normally uh, aerobic improvements actually happen relatively quickly. You just have to be consistent with it. So if you have a, some kind of very mild running program for, you know, uh, uh, three days a week for three weeks, you can start inc incorporating, you know, your interval training and, you know, that's where you pick it up for a minute and then you take it down for three minutes or so and there are different variations of that and there you can get much more of an actual cardiovascular benefit where you you teach your body how to work you teach your heart how to work at much higher intensities for a prolonged period of time and that's good for the heart muscle heart tissue but again if your goal is to burn fat longer slower duration ones will always teach you how to do that better so you want to make sure you spend a good amount of time doing it good you're saying talking about this because a lot of people they just want to go as I said before from zero to a hundred right away and they tend to get injured like yes. you, you were talking previously is uh most of the time your body is not ready mm -hmm. because Absolutely. you're sitting down most of the time right you have muscles that are too short others that are not strong enough and then you're gonna push and then you're gonna use those same muscles and you're gonna start feeling pain in your knees in your hips in your shoulder yep. and that's gonna throw you off the act the physical activity so then you're gonna de be depressed injured taking some kind of muscle relaxer or i don't know painkiller whatever and it because is. you're depressed you can go back to either drinking so or eating ice habits. cream yes and then you're gonna have the misconception i want to tend to talk about this that exercise hurts you no but no, ex it's exercise what you did. does not hurt you what you did is probably hurt you but there's always there's always a way to start and prepare yourself and that's a, another thing and I should probably clarify that since I've been talking about running um, people use running as a way to get in shape absolutely there is a, you can use uh, running as a way to get to your goals but you have to be in a good enough shape to actually run so that means you want to make sure your tissue is prepared you have some strength you have some knowledge of form and doing things because running you know is one of the things that gets most of us most of the people if you ever talk to them have you ever had a running injury they'll say yes why yeah. how does that happen it's just again it's same thing as you mentioned like going from not doing anything to doing everything and doing it very hard and that that's how you get hurt yeah so so that's where it becomes important to make sure that you spend your time they're releasing the tight tissue, strengthening the important things like your hamstrings, your glutes, your core, learning how to run, how to become a midfoot or a, you know a toe striker. If you, by the way, this is a big tip here. If you run as you walk, then you are not running correctly. So people who are heel strikers tend to have much higher rates of knee injuries. So make sure you are not running on your heels. How so should you run? Ideally, as you run, the first thing that comes there on the ground either should be the middle of your foot or the ball of your foot. Uh, some people feel very comfortable with the ball of the foot. I'm much more of a midfoot striker. Just lets you. What that does is it lets your ankle joint and your calves to absorb some of the impact before it goes higher into your knee and into your hip. When you slam on the uh, heel, it's like applying the brakes every step. It bypasses the ankle joint and all the soft tissue between your knee and your foot and go straight into the knee cartilage and that's how you get uh, you know meniscus problems patellar uh, you know tendon problems um, and all kinds of other even higher up in the hip problems um, so you want to make sure you you have a proper form and make sure your calves are nice and loose so they can absorb that impact and the other thing uh, is also a lot of people tend to be very hip flexor dominant runners yes. so they just kind of focus on bringing the foot forward most of the running should occur by you pushing off the behind leg so the leg as you step step turnover occurs the leg that's on the ground should be pulling you through and pushing you forward as opposed to just kind of stepping it and letting your body's momentum carry you over and just bring the leg from behind over and just kind of feel it all in the front so the hamstrings and the glutes become very, very important muscles and unfortunately a lot of times very underworked and weak muscles and that's how people get into different hip problems. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, one thing, also another very common thing is um, iliotibial syndrome, so uh, uh, ITBS, so iliotibial band syndrome, uh, or maltracking patella related issues. And those normally happen again with weaker hamstrings and weaker glutes, because as your hip flexors become tighter, they shut down your glutes. And the glutes are the, essentially the, the muscles that are, sta that are responsible for stabilizing your knee joint because they stabilize your hip. The knee itself does only flexion extension, it just bends, but the hip rotation at the hip is what determines which way your knee is pointing at each foot strike. So when the hips become really weak and your legs start turning in, you put the knee at a much more of a danger just because now the impact is very asymmetrical. Um, technically running is always happening in three, di in three dimensions, but you wanna just make sure that your joints stay aligned with your running pathway. And once that becomes an issue, that's when the knees start getting a little creaky, things start hurting, and then eventually you get you build up wear and tear and something gives out and then you can't run for a few weeks. I'm just gonna try mm -hmm. to bring this a little bit more simple language. Uh, so what Stan is saying is a lot of people are more, like this is the lab, right? The, uh, I can't say like that because some people are listening. Uh, <laughs> people become stronger on the front of the leg yes. and not really on the butt in the back of the leg. Yes. So that starts creating an imbalance, yes, right? Absolutely. And uh, so it's really important to the person to pay attention on this, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I, 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 I looked for uh, Stan this time ago because I had a client, I, not one only, I have a few clients that have a big problem activating the butt mm -hmm. because uh, I bring this Stan can correct me on this like people are sitting down for such long hours mm -hmm. and we are sitting down the butt is off right uh -huh. the front of your legs are tight yes absolutely right? they are flexed they are tight mm -hmm. and you're taking the stress from work like your body wants to do something about it so you're activated you're not there relaxed taking stress and doing oh I have to finish this in half an hour my boss is gonna yell at me but it's okay I'm so relaxed <laughs> No, right? No, you absolutely can't not. says how. And if you start paying attention on your body, you're going to see your tense. What? Tell me the areas people are most tense now. Well, uh, most common, uh, the uh, general uh, life related stress was traps, upper traps. The problem is upper traps. Everybody's here. I mean, there's a couple of reasons. You're on your phone here, and then you're on your computer here, and then you're here during the rest of the day. Uh, this causes a bit of a misalignment in your uh, scapula, so then people end up having more shoulder problems, especially guys, because girls, not so much, because they girls normally are not going to go in there and try to bench press 300 pounds but guys go in and try to bench press and their shoulders are a little out of alignment and then you stress structures that shouldn't be necessarily stressed or aren't necessarily prepared for stress shrubs i keep yelling at my husband don't do shrubs i tell him if you want bigger upper traps there's nothing wrong with that it's just it's very important to know how to deactivate them how to activate your lats and how to keep you know scapula depressed for the proper, you know, for when it needs to be depressed. There's nothing wrong with shrugging a little bit if you know how to get your traps disengaged and your lights engaged. But, but going along with that line and going back to our running up, uh, most of, again, most of my clients spend almost of their day sitting down, their hip flexors become very tight. Uh, there's a principle of reciprocal inhibition. It's essentially like an, a bioenergetic sufficiency model where your body just over years, you know, millions of years of adaptation learns how to, you know, save energy by kind of locking things that are normally working anyway. So if you, let's say, spend most of your day flexing your bicep, not that I'm trying to show off or anything, but you know, <laughs> if you spend most of your time, eventually your tricep becomes disengaged. Or if you're trying to do a bicep curl, let's say, your bicep becomes engaged and your tricep becomes disengaged because if you try to activate your bicep and tricep at the same time, you're not really going anywhere and just kind of get stuck. So that same principle where one muscle, as one muscle tries to do something, the opposite muscle disengages, that same principle applies in pretty much every single joint with you know agonist and antagonist muscles and which is you know positive or negative direction working muscles so going back to our hip flexors and our butt muscles when you spend most of the time sitting down because the hip flexors are shortened and like in a tighter state your body just leaves them there and it leaves them there even though you don't technically need them to be tight but because it assumes oh well i'm going to be spending the next two hours here anyway your body doesn't understand when you need to get up and go that that's it you don't really need to sit anymore it just kind of leaves you there because that's what it's been doing for the last you know four or five hours since your lunch break yeah and uh, 
so when people are coming to the gym right after work their hip flexors are still tight and their glutes are underactive because their body told them well look i've been sitting here with my hip flexors shortened if i try to engage my butt cheeks it's going to do the opposite of what i've been doing for the last four hours so let's you know let's not engage glutes so that's why you want to come in you want to stretch the hell out of your hip flexors you want to foam roll them because that will actually deactivate them it's absolutely possible to deactivate overactive muscles you just have to spend some time on it and then you want to do a little bit of a warm-up whether it's your basic glute bridges you know and just squeeze the butt cheeks and get them working get some blood flowing so that when you do go out and you exercise you're not just abusing your hip flexors which have been tight the whole day but you're actually ready by engaging your glutes and you know pushing through the through the hip joint properly. very good very good so it's not only getting to the gym and just like let me kill it and get out of here no right take some time absolutely so what would be your recommendation warm up then uh foam roll a little bit yeah i will what would be most almost all my clients i'll tell them to come in and foam roll before you start this all my fascia release uh, is always a good way uh, foam rolls have become much more popular these days and there's a huge reason for that because they actually work but people don't foam roll just because they want to look cool. No, people actually foam roll because it does good. So if your quads and your hip flexors are tight from sitting all day long, you foam roll, you get a little sweaty just because it's really uncomfortable. But the reason it's uncomfortable is because they are trigger points, which is essentially clamped up muscle tissue or fascia that needs to be released because if it doesn't release, it will stay tight and your glutes will stay disengaged so you kind of spend a bit of time foam rolling and releasing and you want to do a bit of dynamic stretch pre-workout always dynamic static stretches are very good once you finish but pre-workout always do dynamic because that will prevent you from losing any kind of possible strength that you can have because that's actually static stretches have been shown to decrease power production immediately post so maybe if you, you know static stretch for 10 minutes and then a lot of gag for five ten minutes you'll be okay again but most of us normally once we finish warming up we go straight into exercise so dynamic warm-up routines dynamic stretches are always beneficial and uh, absolutely spend some time doing very light activation exercises so whether uh, it's lateral band walks whether it's you know a simple plank to get your core engaged whether it's simple glute bridge whatever it is that you like whatever it is you can find some resources on you know always a good way to start so let's say um, one of my clients um, just one let's say I'm trying to pick somebody in my brain but so let's say one of my female clients um, every time I see her we're always starting with a good hip flexor uh, you know uh, quad roll out uh, in the newest routine we've been doing 20 second uh, basic bridge hold then we're gonna repeat because uh, what that does when you hold a uh, muscle in an active state for at least six seconds it gives you a full uh, if it gives the muscle uh, the ability to you know engage to its fullest so like get all the fibers firing more How or less how many seconds do you think normally this is according to science it takes about six seconds of very strong contraction 20 seconds i go 20 seconds just to let the nerves fire up and get everything going so it doesn't kill them so it's not like holding a bridge for one minute where by the time you're done it's like oh my god i don't want to do anything else <laughs> so it's just enough for them to feel it but not enough to kill them uh -huh. and then after that we go into 10 very easy you know dynamic bridges up and down and then we can switch to the outside where we'll do a 20 second hold on a single leg 20 second hold on the opposite single leg so it's still in the bridge and then you do 10 bridges up and down in one leg 10 bridges up and down on the other leg so you kind of pre-warm them with the first with the bilateral bridge where it's both legs and then and then you uh you can add a little bit more uh, you know uh, a little bit more work by lifting the same weight with a single leg so then you do that for a couple of sets and it'll be nice and warm so that way when you get into your lunges you do your bridges or bridges sorry if you go into your deadlifts or into your squats or even if you're going running you can get something going there uh, and then also lateral band walks uh, one important thing there um, glute medius I know so I'm sure if anybody's ever had to deal with uh, you know physical therapy they've heard of that muscle because that's normally the muscle especially pertaining to running is the big muscle that stabilizes the knee uh, during especially the eccentric phase of the step it just uh, it will keep your knees healthy if your glute medius is nice and strong it will prevent your knee from buckling inwards uh, no, valgus is a technical term so um when your knees break in, yeah right? so when your because knees kind of collapse in yeah, collapse uh, yeah in. especially uh, uh, for women it's a very common thing because yeah. uh, just the q angle the angle at which the hips or the uh, the femur bone comes out of the hips is much narrower for women than it is for men who have much straighter legs going straight down uh, but because of that angle your knees become a, a little bit more of a risk 
just because the uh, you know the uh, the um, what do you call them? Uh, the forces at the knee are increased just to due to increase the angles and uh, having the those the angle starts increasing the tendencies just go down the hill right? exactly exactly so it just gets worse over time so you want to make sure that your glute meets stay nice and strong and again so lateral band walks where you have a band around your knee and you're, you're kind of in a hinge state you hinge through the hip you push your butt behind you as much as you can so you're kind of bent over but again you're bent through the hip not through your back and you're just taking those lateral steps will help you increase the you know the strength on the you know the butt muscles towards the outside and that's going to help you keep your knees nice and stable it's going to which is going to help you in return obviously keep them nice and healthy so how do you know if you have these issues you can uh, squat in front of the mirror right or when you're squatting like i asked this guy asked me some time ago i said because he was complaining about the pain in front of his hips i said uh you know uh what's going on it's like are you activating your butt oh no but the squats isn't for the, the front of the thighs isn't for the quads I think there is a little misconception there yes. because, correct me, Stan, the butt should do most of the work after the core being a strong core, mm -hmm. the butt should push and pull stuff away from yeah. you, right? Everybody, depending on the form of the squat, uh, normally depending on your hip angles and the knee angles, there will be some discrepancy in amount of work being done through each muscle, but glutes absolutely have to work. Glutes are like the biggest leg muscle you have. So quads realistically only work well three because quad the reason they're called quadriceps is because there are four heads to the muscle three of those heads only operate at the knee so just they all they do is extend the, uh, the knee the other part the uh, rectus femoris which also extends the knee it also does hip flexion but in an odd way during certain times it can actually aid in the hip extension too rather than just the hip flexion yeah, it's a little uh, weird but it, there's a very somebody did a very interesting biomechanical breakdown of it but not to confuse people anyway so so technically your quads do mostly most work just at the knee so if you're going to get your hips moving which is what's going to happen when you run that's what's going to happen when you do lunges squat, squat absolutely as we're talking in deadlift Grab something heavy from the floor exactly lifting things up most of that action is going to happen at the hip the knee is going to absolutely help but if that's the case then obviously you're going to need very strong butt to be able to do those you know activities in a healthy manner Yes, so, yeah. and then it comes down to people already tied on the hip flexors, right? Mm -hmm. The front of the thighs, the front of the hip are already very active on that. The butt is off. So if you don't pay attention to what you're doing, you're going to keep working those muscles that are already overworking and you're going to yep. increase the imbalance in that joint. Absolutely. Right? So that's why you have to keep your mind into your body. Yes. Stop thinking about things you got to do, like, you know, pays you gotta, bills you got to pay. Take that one hour to just focus on yourself. Yes that's going to actually make you enjoy better the exercise no absolutely right? yeah and uh, going back to as you were talking about you know uh, feeding into bad habits i've discovered that glute under activation and just general tight hips are one of the most common reasons for why people have lower back issues it's because people don't know how to move through the you know hip joints and the next thing you know they have to bend through their back to lift something and then oh my god my back hurts i wonder why well that's because your hips are tight and you don't know how to use your legs to lift heavier things um, no, not to say that, you know, your back, the reason our spine has all those vertebrae is because it needs to be able to bend, it needs to be able to rotate. You want to have a very mobile, healthy spine, but there's a difference between abusing it and just using it. You want to use it, but you just don't want to abuse it. There's time and a place for you to use it, but most of the time you want to lift your heavier things with stronger muscles, and that's where your hips and, you know, your knees come into play. I'm so glad I dragged you into this side of the stuff I wanted to talk, because I'm really passionate about this. I think a lot of people go through pain nowadays they don't know what's going on and it's something logical right oh, yeah, you understand absolutely. what no, it is absolutely everything in your body it makes sense it's like i think that's one of the reasons why i like fitness is because again in college my first major i chose was economics my and i ended up getting into a finance field but uh, my second was physics and so I, I like the whole mechanical concept because body is very, very, if you want to have basic understanding of physics, you will understand how everything works in the body. It's just a whole bunch of levers. It's nothing, whole bunch of levers. yeah, it's nothing, yeah. nothing different. And uh, just your muscle tissue, some, some force that's applied to a lever, which is your joint and or joint is a fulcrum. And then you work from there. So as you have an understanding of that, it makes everything a little bit easier. And everything in our body makes sense. There's 
no random magical pain or magical discomfort or magical injury. If something happened, it happened for a reason. And the goal as a rehab, especially once you get into rehab, is to understand why it happened. And you prehab it once you recover. You prehab it by making sure that you don't let that happen again. So you do things to prevent it because it's a lot easier to prevent injury than to treat injury. Yeah. It's, uh, it's so it's all that's why it's always important to come into the gym, spend the first five ten minutes doing the smart things, and not just like I ah, screw this. I'm gonna lift the heaviest weight and I warm up. Mm. You're, gonna um, get you're not doing yourself any favors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stan, I want to ask you something. Like I'm very, uh, I'm a huge adept of high intense interval training or mm -hmm. interval trainings. I like to compare with our ancestors because mm -hmm. they suddenly had to run away to oh, become food or run mm -hmm. after something to eat and then have the rewarding meal yeah. afterwards and you were talking about the endurance training mm -hmm. right the more uh, the, the long duration mm -hmm. so how would you like uh, bring a parallel between two thinking like what's your opinion about it why do you think it's ideal considering of course what you said before that it's good to start in endurance because you don't want to get hurt you want yeah. to train yourself first and yeah. then get in a little bit more intensity yeah. 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 well the reason i brought up the well one it's you there's just uh, you will be, you will make your you know fat oxidative systems the systems that actually burn the fat uh, much more efficient when you spend more time training them it's like you know if you practice guitar for five minutes versus if you practice your guitar for 35 minutes a day which one is, do you think is going to make you better at playing guitar so the same thing if your goal is to burn some fat in the beginning if you haven't done anything you want to spend a bit more time there that being said high intensity interval training is absolutely great uh, the, don't get me wrong the thing there is because it's higher intensity you want to make sure your tissue is prepared for it so if you're going to use high intensity intervals in your aerobic training you want to make sure that you spend some time doing slower work to prepare your tissue for it before you go into higher intensity it's like you know you're not going to go into the gym and say you're going to squat you're not going to go for the heaviest weight you think you can do right now and then take a little break and do it again no you're going to come in you're going to start slower so it's kind of i like to approach my you know cardiovascular activity the same way especially with completely untrained clients most of the time people will come into me and they say hey yeah, i've been doing this i've been doing that so most of my clients realistically what they need is an ass kicking and get to do more work and to increase their intensity but that being said if you're more or less you know slightly newer to this or if you haven't been doing any long slow duration type activity there is a lot of benefit to be gained from that yeah. So, so yeah, yeah the high intensity interval training is absolutely great and will get you some great results and also get you results at a very good rate. The difference there is according to again some studies and this is actually I learned through our EFTI people, um, the plateau that you reach, you will reach it faster but then again you reach quicker results with the high intensity training. But that plateau is normally a little lower especially in regards to your cardiovascular abilities then the plateau you will reach had you been you know building up much slower mm -hmm. so you will reach the same plateau that you reached at the uh, you know higher intensity training later but you can break through that plateau much easier than you would if you were doing it you know through just high intensity training and again this is for cardiovascular benefits if you're just talking about the heart being able to pump blood and doing things and you know the metabolic training um, obviously there are a few other things that, will, that can always go into consideration your actual soft tissue adaptability and your muscles being able to carry the load that you request them to do yeah. so a lot of times when you tell somebody okay we're going to do push-ups we're going to do squats we're going to do burpees whatever and by the way burpees I'm not a big fan of burpees there I don't have one client that does burpees very good I don't then. Have one. yeah uh, if you like doing burpees if you have a reason for them absolutely but it's normally you know most people do burpees just to get somebody tired to get themselves tired there are other healthier ways you can get yourself tired you know I, I was asking you know Greg Cook right mm -hmm. I was talking to him that uh, we went gladly to a dinner over mm -hmm. Fatima was cooking mm -hmm. that was part of the podcast in the past mm -hmm. and I asked him like you know how to get because I teach boot camp classes is that's a very challenging task on my head because mm -hmm. I don't want to hurt anyone and then I told him like how can I get them tired and he said tell them to not sleep <laughs> Because it's true, you don't want to just get tired, you want a good workout, that's yeah, what you want. Right, you want yeah. a good workout, it's gonna add something to you. Absolutely. Yeah. No, so yeah, the one as you do your things, you know, it's important to have reasons for everything. And that's why we kinda started this conversation. We were talking about what kind of things to do if you're going to burn a bit of fat and you'll look a little bit more tight for the uh, for the summer and for the beach season. But at the end of the day, whatever workout you pick, higher intensity is good, it's just 
you want to make sure you have a reason for it. So for my clients, let's say a typical uh, recommendation would be two days, especially if somebody whose main goal is to lose a bit of body fat or talent. Two, if you can do three days of strength training a week and a cardio a day in between. If it's somebody okay. new, That's we're going to do three full days of strength, strength, full body strength training. And the reason for full body is, uh, you know, like bodybuilding type workout programs are very common and very popular because you come in and you're going to do chest. You're going to come in, you're going to do some arms, you know. And uh, Sorry to interrupt. No, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so if, you know, if you're going to come in, if you're going to do a, a certain strength training routine, I will always suggest that you do full body. Because what that does is it challenges your muscles within that workout, gives them a couple days recovery, and you can challenge them again. If you do a bodybuilding type workout, you do your chest one day, and then chances are you're gonna, not going to come back to you know for another week. And some people get very good results by doing certain things just, you know, once a week. Most of us don't need a little bit more stimulus to get maximum, you know, adaptation. So that's why you will do, uh, you know, full body workout, let's say Monday, full body workout Wednesday, full body workout Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you can do a little bit of light, you know, light cardio. And as, you know, time goes on and you need to, you know, tighten up certain things a little bit more, if you want to put on a little bit more muscle, because you can't spot reduce fat. That's I'm afraid that another misconception that goes around is like, you know, let me do some abs so I can burn some fat around the stomach. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Everybody will decide where it wants to burn fat. I always say that. Yes. We don't choose. Yeah, Your we body don't choose. choose. Exactly. No matter how many sit-ups you're going to do, it yeah. doesn't mean that you're going to burn you fat. You can put on some good muscle mass in your stomach, and it's excellent, but it's not necessarily going to burn any more fat in the area. So, you know, that's why, you know, as you do full body workouts, your body normally goes under a little bit more recovery because it has to recover through multiple areas as opposed to just your chest, you know, through a couple of muscle fibers. You will have to recover through multiple muscle fibers, through multiple areas, so that increases, you know, again, your exercise, you know, post-oxygen consumption. And then the next day when you're doing some more fat burning, you're just burning a few more, uh, you know, fat calories doing your cardio. And, you know, again, sticking with that for a few weeks, there will definitely be some progress as long as you're making sure that you're not eating more and hopefully eating less. Now, another thing I would like to mention about eating less is people like to starve themselves. That's not how it works. Normally, you want to have some caloric reduction, but you can't be like having your food. Like you can't eat only half of what you ate before. I think realistically, right yeah. Like uh, zero to 100 again, again you yeah, shouldn't. It doesn't work that way. So you want, to, you want to reduce your calories, but what happens when you the caloric restrictions are extremely severe, you can easily put your body into kind of a starvation mode where one thing that will burn off is your muscle tissue. And then you can lose some quick pounds on the scale, but it will not necessarily make you look any better in the mirror. And most of us care about how our clothes fit and how we look in the mirror yes. as opposed to how much we weigh on the scale. Because scale is, if you're getting ready for a fight and you need to make the, you know, maybe from your Brazilian Jiu Jitsu days, maybe you had to cut the weight, then that yeah, would be a different story. Yeah, but I can attach to this idea the very serious cut once at once. You know, I didn't really know what I was doing. I thought mm -hmm. I just have to shut my mouth and reduce my calories intake. And I got to the tournament. I was dead meat. Like, right. I you was dead meat. I was out of energy. Yeah, maybe your metabolic activity goes down. Your body, anything you put in at that point, your body will actually store it saying, oh my God, I'm going to... Because again, going back to our ancestors, when there's a drought, when there's famine, you have no food. So when you find food, it's like, oh crap, food. And you just shovel it in your yes. mouth and your body goes, all right. So... Let Good. me save these now exactly. because I don't know when I'm going to start Yes, again. and over the right. process of evolution, the guys who are the best at saving the energy were the ones who weren't dying from starvation. So, but and then hopefully they would live long enough to find the next source of food. And uh, our body kind of works the same way. So, if you don't eat and then you shovel everything in your mouth, the next thing you know, your body goes, oh crap, I'm just going to save everything here. So, you want to reduce your calories, but you don't want to reduce your calories very drastically. Um, Precision Nutrition, if you Google it, has very good portion control guides for just, you know, they use uh, your hand as a guide, so you have the palm of your head and your thumb size to help, you know, judge how much or what kind of food you should be eating. And so if you Google, the, you know, Precision Nutrition portion control, there's, uh, you know, quite a good, of, yeah, quite I'll a lot post of the tip. I'll post the link afterwards. I just want to get to one point towards eating habits because we were talking and you spoke about 
some uh, football player, I think that he had to gain some weight or like a lot of uh, calorie intake and he started drinking milk. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I'm, I'm afraid name? I forgot his name, but he, uh, yeah, don't he used to... I don't remember his name. He, you can look I'll him up. i he, he used to be, I don't remember if it's... In, I'm pretty sure he still plays for... Because I'm 99% sure he didn't retire, but you know, the off-season trades all the time. But like he played American football. He was a defensive lineman for the Chicago Bears. I can't remember his name, so sorry about that. But if you look him up, so what happened was his general caloric intake goal was about 10,000 calories. Because those guys need to be really big and they need to move a lot of weight and need to be really strong. <coughs> Excuse me. So to make sure that he managed to get up to that weight, he actually started drinking like a gallon of milk and adding a whole bunch of ice cream to his diet. <laughs> the problem with that is though a lot of that food and a lot of food that he was eating was very inflammatory. So he, he said he got to a point where he got into a bathtub and everything hurt so bad that he couldn't get out. So the day after that he said screw it and the day after that he more or less just fully turned vegan. He ate his first bean burger and hasn't looked back since then. He's about 275 pounds right now, in the best shape he's ever been. And runs around, his agility, his strength is up to par. And uh, he's a vegan guy. So the thing there is, the problem with being a vegan and getting high amounts of calories, because there's uh, Kendricks, I forget his first name, but he's a US Olympic uh, heavy, uh, weightlifter in the uh, like heavyweight division. So he's a huge guy lifting ridiculous amounts of weight and he's a vegan too. The problem with those, you know, they eat very, very good things. The problem there is though, because the vegan food is so nutritionally dense, your hunger levels normally tend to stay suppressed because your body goes, well, I've gotten all my nutrients, I don't really need anything. Uh, Good, think about it. Your body got all the nutrients. I don't need anything. Exactly. Consider the calories you're intaking. Yeah, because right? normally if you look at actually like an obesity problem, so the reason people become obese is because they eat really garbage food that has no nutritional no value. Nutrition. So they will take in 500, 600 calories of junk and their body goes, well, I need nutrition. You're so it will, hungry. Yeah, it will, be, it will still be hungry, but it will be starving for nutrients, not calories. Your body doesn't really understand when you put calories and I was like, oh, energy, I can't use it, I'm going to save it. Because it can't just randomly expel energy, you know, unless you figure out how to shoot it out, that would be great. Then you can just shoot energy rays everywhere. But until then, you, your body just stores everything. But when you have nutritionally dense food, your hunger levels go down, so you don't feel like you need to eat a lot. So those two athletes that I was talking about, they, but because their energetic demands are very high, they have to eat like very, you know, high density like smoothies and it becomes almost work, like very heavy work to just get those calories into your system. So you have to spend time eating and that becomes one of the tasks they focus on. Like for most of us, like, oh my God, I overate. How do I do that? So we're worrying about not overeating. They're worrying about making sure that they eat enough calories just because the food that you choose can have a huge effect on your appetite and you know, and your satiation levels. So that's why. Right. In the pain, right? Oh, because you're creating this exactly. is the point I wanted to reach because you can create, you highly can inflame your body because Absolutely. of your eating habits. Yeah, so he was eating burgers, he was eating, he was drinking lots of milk, a lot of dairy Fries, products. Donuts. Absolutely. Yeah, but because donuts. those things are very high in calories, so you can get your energy levels up. But the problem is, all the things that come with it, they also cause a lot of inflammation. Digestive issues, very common problems, you know, as some of my clients have. Normally, somebody has a significant enough of a weight issue there's normally a digestive issue associated with it because one of the other common things is most people when especially people who have very high stress jobs have very little time to eat so they'll get down and just shovel everything in without anything. chewing and yeah. just swallow it the problem is when you chew your digestion starts at the mouth you, the saliva covers it and proper enzymes that help you break down the food once it gets into the stomach when you bypass it you avoid a huge chunk of your digestive system also when you bypass that you normally uh, the food is in much bigger chunks so your stomach has to work that much harder and then you get a whole bunch of other issues coming up through that so one of the easier ways uh, to help you, you know, not eat too much is to spend more time chewing. Because when you spend more time chewing, what happens is you will actually get your, take more time and give your food more time to hit the bottom of your stomach and send the, okay, I'm full signal back to your brain. When you eat really fast, this food is still here, 
when you're technically should have been done eating, but because you don't feel, you know, that you're full because the food needs yeah. to travel down a little bit more, you manage to travel in a lot more. Probably so, over. so yeah, the faster you eat, normally the more common, you know. Maybe uh, you're too overexcited in your mind. Is still your body's gonna even have more problems to like, you know, deal with that food, right? No, absolutely. Again, again, the less, the, the more, the more prepared the food is for digestion. By the time it gets to stomach, the easier it is for it to digest. So you have fewer digestive issues. Stan, I'm gonna get you with a question that I didn't let you know uh, it's beforehand. Okay. Um, so. Could you tell me one thing that you could recommend to people that they should do every day to help them achieve their fitness goals? Uh, okay, that's actually a very good one. And now I'm, I can't give a blanket statement because for everybody it's a little <laughs> different. Yeah. Um, like uh, one of the more common things I hear is like, so yeah, I heard, you know, it's mostly diet, you know, uh, like for my fitness goals. Or somebody else comes up and like, so how much working out do I need to do? So it really depends. Uh, I think one important thing is you need to determine a specific task for that day that's going to help you reach your, you know, reach your goal, whether it's working out or not partying too hard that night or eating a better meal that dinner or that, that day and just stick into that particular task. One plan. One, 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 specific, one specific action specific item, yes. Action. That's yeah. very good. Yeah, because for everybody it's going to be different. Some people come in and like, so look, I have this goal. So if somebody comes into me and they're in the gym six days a week and they need, they've been working out six days a week and they're sweating, they're doing their cardio, they're doing their weightlifting, but they still need, you know, to lose like five percent body fat, then most likely it's their diet. Because I mean, as short of them coming in, you know, and working out for six hours a day, they can't really do much, and that's not realistic. Some people will spend six hours working out, but those guys are on a completely different level. And some people will have the best diets. But they just don't that you know spend enough time active and they say look man i want my arms to look nicer my shoulders to look nicer for you know for the beach but you know like i come in and i work out a little bit and i kind of feel better but i feel like i'm not doing it and for that particular person will be just coming in and working a little bit harder lifting a little bit more weight doing a few more sets so i can't give a blanket statement and then you'll have people who are eating healthily and who are already you know getting all their exercises in like one of my uh, clients uh, Jim and been training for about I don't know a year year and a half now actually I got him from uh, 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 Danny Branco uh, um, Daniel Blanco not Blanco sorry I have one so uh, Branco Fernando Fernando, Fernando Branco yes yeah, yeah, another, another uh, what do you call him uh, fellow Brazilians yeah uh, and uh, like Jim and I've been working on because his diet we fixed up a couple of things he had a couple, you know, he liked to eat his, you know, barbecue ribs over the weekend. So we got rid of that. Uh, you know, his weekends are very good. And he comes in, he spends about two hours at the gym every time he's at work, which is Monday through Friday. And then Saturday or Sunday, he'll normally work out at home. So for him, I can't really tell him to eat more or less. Well, and I can't really tell him to exercise more. But one thing that we've been trying is to figure out how the hell to get him to sleep better. So again, for everybody it's different, so whether it's going to bed earlier that night or if you're going out and you know that you're going to go out with your friends and you normally get in like 12 drinks or that night, maybe just saying, okay, sticking with a plan and uh, one, a couple of things that I normally tell my clients, one of the two things you can do either get a drink that you can sip and just spend more time sipping it, take smaller sips and just <laughs> hold it without drinking, or if you need to, once you finish your drink, the next drink should be non-alcoholic, preferably just a glass of water and sip on the water. Because you can spend as much time, you know, or if you're taking shots, take a shot of water, whatever. Just replace. It's very hard to say no to your friends. Sometimes you have to. So again, for everybody, one specific thing is going to be very different. But one specific thing that everybody should do is figure out what their action item is for that day. Sometimes it's better to do over the course of a week. So maybe you sit down on Sunday saying for Monday I'm doing this, for Tuesday I'm doing this, for Thursday I'm doing this, whatever. Plan. And yeah, plan it out and stick to it. It's always easier if you plan it as opposed to just trying to wing it on the spot. Okay. No. All right. I wanted to talk so much more with Stan, but we have some uh, sessions to go after. But uh, Stan, thank you so much for doing Absolutely. this with me. Absolutely. Thanks for I having me. Truly appreciate it. Uh, appreciate it. And, um, this will be soon available at uh, Restart Fitness and um, YouTube. And please feel free to reach out with questions. I'm very grateful to people that reach out with comments and watch and anything. We are gonna, we, I'm putting stand on this already. I'm gonna be, you know, uh, answering. And uh, please thank you for watching us. And uh, I really hope that this was uh, very useful. Yeah. This is the point. You know, more people have to have access to this 
information. No, absolutely. Yeah, if you guys have any questions for me, um, she tagged me, sent me a friend request, sent me a message, whatever you have. Uh, I will try to give you as much information as I can without boring you with it. But, you know, yeah, if again, if you have any questions, shoot me a friend request, shoot me, you know, a message and I'll answer your questions. Stan is at uh, Equinox Printing House in West Village, right? You can get access to him through Facebook, Instagram. Yes, right? but my Instagram is not very fitness related. This is my Facebook, but I answer my Facebook messages. So. Okay, so please feel free to reach out and uh, that's it. I hope I'll see you next time. Right, thank you guys. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Give me a hug. <laughs> thank you.